So welcome to today's open house highlight panel. I'm Dave Ford. I'm the founder of Soul Buffalo and the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network. The Ocean Plastic Leadership Network is 65 members strong. We launched in January. We're an activist and industry community that is dedicated to solving the ocean plastic crisis by 2030. And we're just so excited for you to join us today for this open house spotlight panel with some of the top minds dedicated to waste picking and the waste picking crisis. Ian has his serious hat on. <laughs> well, listen, the only reason I'm wearing a hat is because I have a very serious COVID haircut. <laughs> so last year in May, we ran the first ever Ocean Plastic Leadership Summit in the middle of the Atlantic Gyre. And it was on that trip that we brought together five waste picking organizations to form PAL, the Plastic Pickers Operational Working Group with Thread First Mile, who's on our panel today, Mr. Green Africa in Nairobi, Shintan in India, Plastic for Change in India, and Wego, based in Brazil. It's been initially funded and it's being administered by the Meridian Institute. And it's all about bringing and sharing best practices together, not only to empower these communities and the people working, but to give them access to global supply chains. And today we are gonna dive in to how we go about mobilizing an equitable ocean-bound plastic supply chain. And the question that we really want to consider is how might we surface and share compelling ways for corporations to source ocean-bound plastics from waste-picking communities in the global south? When we really look at this Venn diagram, these three overlapping circles that are mission critical to this issue with respect to building vibrant supply chains in the global south, community health, entrepreneurship, and supply chains. First, so I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Dune Ives, Managing Director of Lonely Whale and Next Wave Plastics. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for having me on this panel and to all the other panelists. I'm really honored to be here in representing Next Wave. So I'll just give a quick overview of Next Wave. Next Wave Plastics is a corporate member-driven uh, organization with the goal of diverting 25,000 tons of plastic which is the equivalent of 1.2 billion single-use plastic water bottles by the end of the year 2025 in support of UN SDG 14.1. Um, we have 10 member companies that are uh, really working together to scale up in a very open source and transparent fashion, the first ocean-bound plastic network. Currently, we have 18 suppliers, as you can see on this global map, from 14 countries. And really one of the, the key things that we're focused on is creating redundancy in the supply and making sure that these supply chains can have commercial scaling, but really with keeping in mind the social responsibility that each of the corporations holds so important to the work that they do in every community that they work within. So we have a very significant social working group, uh, social responsibility working group activity underway this year. And are looking forward to talking to you that as part of the panel today. So thanks so much for having me. Thanks, dude. And I'd like to introduce Kieran Smith, who's the CEO and co-founder of Mr. Green Africa and based in Nairobi. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here as well. Um, yeah, just a, a few a few words on, on what Mr. Green Africa is doing. Um, as you can see here, the centerpiece is the community and and what we've built is a network of suppliers where we also formalize them so we're trying to really transition uh, informal supplier into a more formal supply chain and we're leveraging technology in order for us to do that at scale uh, and we're supporting that with a with an infrastructure that allows us to not only connect the network with the offtake market but also to create a high value uh, quality of uh, so-called pcr uh, for that market. And we're super proud to be part of this panel and we're looking forward to have fruitful discussions um, uh, uh, today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Karen. And now I'd like to introduce Ellen Joukowsky, the Chief Sustainability and Social Impact Officer at HP. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, so at HP, we call our strategy sustainable impact because it's not just about how we make ourselves more sustainable, but how we enable our customers and the communities that we serve to be sustainable in their choices. 
in terms of ocean-bound plastic, the way that we think about this issue, it's really part of our bigger approach to enabling a circular economy. And we've set an industry-leading goal to use 30% recycled content plastic in our products by 2025, and that's across our printing and personal systems portfolio. As part of how we're gonna achieve this big, bold, difficult goal, um, one of the ways that we're investing is in the ocean-bound plastic area. Uh, back in September 2016, we decided to set up an ocean-bound plastic supply chain in Haiti. And uh, to date, we've now used more than 60 million bottles of ocean-bound plastic, preventing those bottles from flowing into the ocean and instead upcycling them into some of the HP products you see here. So it started in our ink cartridges uh, and then we're able to scale across our PC portfolio into our Chromebooks, our notebooks, our desktops, our display monitors, our all-in-ones. So this is a huge commitment from HP. We're working hard to scale. It's very hard work, uh, but we have really great partners and look forward to talking to you more about that as well. Thanks, Alan. I'd like to introduce Ian Rosenberger, the founder of First Smile and Thread International. Hey everybody, it's really great to see you and it's really great to see the other panelists. There's a lot of allies in this group and I'm very much looking forward to the, to the panel. My name's Ian, I'm the CEO and founder of First Smile. Um, that's a, it's a part of Thread International. And um, we do a lot of the work that connects um, people in the very first mile of supply chains um, with the really big brands out there that are trying to figure out how to do this well. Um, like Ellen said, um, you know, HP has a really aggressive goal around post-consumer recycled plastic and social innovative plastic. Um, you know, all, most companies out there, especially and particularly the forward thinking ones, are thinking about these goals in really real ways. Um, and our organization helps connect uh, the bottom of the supply chain, the bottom of the pyramid, the first mile, um, with procurement teams um, in ways that help bring both the social impact um, and the environmental impact to life. Um, we've built supply chains all over the world, um, but now we've also started to help map and um, advise large organizations on how they might build their own supply chains. Um, and we've been really successful at that. Um, we've had the opportunity to work um, in the Western um, Hemisphere in, in Haiti and Honduras and in the East in Taiwan and in Bangladesh and a lot, all over South and Southeast Asia. Um, our real expertise though is working um, with the human element of how these supply chains come to be. When uh, uh, large brands engage in ways like this, a lot of the stumbling blocks they find all involve human beings who today, right now, as we're talking, are collecting plastic and saving it from the ocean. There's a whole bundle of things that companies need to think about when they get involved. And as implementers who have been involved in these chains for over 10 years, we really know the step-by-step -step of how to help a brand move from the very beginning of that chain all the way to a, a, a commercialized and scaled version of it. So I'm looking forward to chatting with the, with the group about that. Thanks, Ian. And last, I'd like to introduce Susan Rufo, Executive Director of the Circulate Initiative at Circulate Capital. Thanks for having me. It's great to be part of this uh, part of this panel. So the Circulate Initiative, our mission is to end ocean plastic and build thriving economies. And the way we do this, we think about this in a very practical way. The way we do this is really looking at where is plastic leaking into the ocean. And most of the science shows that particularly from the region we focus on, which is South and Southeast Asia, that's coming from waste management systems, either waste is never collected in the first place or it leaks out of the system because they're overwhelmed by um, either economic development or population growth and just haven't kept up. So what we do is we look at those systems and we figure out how can we make those systems more effective, particularly by helping the entrepreneurs in that system. And that's everyone from the waste collectors all the way up through the big processors. And we look at that and we think, how do we help those entrepreneurs? We can incubate them, we can provide them with technical assistance and knowledge so they can form successful businesses. And then we also help to build the enabling conditions around them, recognizing that no entrepreneur can su succeed in a vacuum. So what they need are the right policy conditions, public awareness, public participation in order to help them succeed. So our mission is really to build that entire ecosystem and allow all of those people to succeed. At the same time, we end ocean plastic and we're creating dignified, sustainable jobs that help the overall communities. So very excited to be part of this group because all of these pieces, as you said in the beginning, Dave, are really interlinked and we can't, we can't solve this problem without all of us. Thanks so much, Susan. Thanks everyone. So we are going to begin. So we're talking about mobilizing an equitable ocean-bound plastic supply chain. And, you know, I think 
when we're in conversations with a lot of our brand partners at the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network, the very aggressive post-consumer recycled plastic goals that a lot of chief sustainability officers are facing right now is daunting. And the 2025 or 2030 deadlines for this are coming fast. And there seems to be a real disconnect at the highest levels of some of these big global brands about just how they're going to source this, where on the sort of juxtaposing that with there seems to be so much supply in the global south. So, you know, maybe I'll throw it out to Dune first. You know, how are these big corporations going to be able to meet their goals, A, and then B, you know, how is it, or can we make it easier for them to engage with a lot of the waste picking organizations in the global south? So we, when we launched Next Wave in 2017, um, one of the reasons why we launched it is the companies that we are working with, even though each one of them has experience in developing suppliers for specific materials that they're missing within their supply chain, or they need to create redundancy in the supply chain, and so they need multiple suppliers. What they were really discovering as they were exploring working with ocean-bound plastic is that this is a brave new world. Some of these suppliers are very small. They're very far away. They're in places that the companies don't necessarily have offices. They're not headquartered. Um, the issues related to the social sustainability of the communities from which the material is derived is critically important to get right. And, and what the companies that we work with determined when we launched together is that no one company in and of themselves is going to be able to do this alone, nor should we. You know, we are all tied together by the ocean. The ocean gives us our every second breath. <laughs> I'll put it in there for the scientists out there listening to this. Every second breath. Um, and it's the one thing that really connects all of us together. And so if we're going to solve for our plastic pollution crisis in the ocean, we have to start working with each other and we have to start identifying best practices for developing these supply chains, what works really well with working within communities, what not to do, I think is also especially important. And then how do we take the best of what each of the companies are doing, the best of these organizations like Circulate Initiative, and then scale those best practices up so that together we can create a global network of ocean-bound plastics supply, and we know how to work with that material. And I think that it's so important, it's, and this is such a great, like, amazing opportunity for all of us, is to kind of break down the silos and shed our borders and to really challenge each other. You know, we have competitors sitting across the table from each other, HP and Dell being two of those, sitting across the table from each other in meetings, having conversations about how they can do more together, right? How they can really challenge each other and learn from each other. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can do in this particular moment. Thanks, dude. And Ellen, so, you know, being really spearheading and pioneering this for HP, like what does it really take to, to get this done, to, to go into the global South and open up a viable supply chain and get it operational? And I know that Ian's been super helpful, you know, on that journey and, and doing, I'd just love to hear like a bit about your journey, about how you brought this to life. Sure. Well, I think we've already touched on it. We can't do it alone. Um, there's no way that we would have been able to source 60 million bottles by now without really strong partners on the ground every day helping us figure out how to do this, how to do this and ensure that the um, collectors in our supply chain have everything that they need, that they're protected, um, that they... Uh, are advancing to meet the requirements of our supply chain code of conduct. Um, we couldn't do this without really strong partners. So we have two that we work with specifically in Haiti um, on this portion of our supply chain, Thread International and Work, um, Thread also known as First Mile, as Ian introduced. Um, and they bring capabilities that we don't have inside our company. So, you know, as we start extending our supply chain to places like this to help solve these environmental and social issues. Uh, we need to bring the right capabilities and the right expertise. And we've been able to find that um, with some really strong partners. Thanks, Alan. Ian, do you want to add, any, add anything there about sort of what you do on the ground there to help the big partners that you work with? Ellen illustrated it brilliantly. I think that um, it is about partnership. And, and we understand that big organizations, their expertise is, isn't in um, understanding what's happening in the first mile of a supply chain. And it shouldn't be. Their expertise is in making things and making things for their customers. And so we decided that it should be our expertise um, to help translate all the things that are happening on the ground 
um, and turn them into playbooks uh, that, that big brands can easily kind of swallow and get through and, and, and work through. You know, I, I started um, the work, the organization that we work with, uh, with HP as well. And um, they're a sister organization. One's a nonprofit, one's a for-profit. And the reason that we did that is that there are economic um, uh, problems that require uh, intricate solutions uh, in, in these supply chains. And there's also very important social ones. And, you know, what we do is we really help brands figure out um, how to use a language or vocabulary that they're used to. Many times, especially with food brands or, or, or beverage brands, that has to do with creating supply chains um, around ingredients, um, organic farming, co-ops, et cetera. Um, and then use that, that language and that vocabulary and that system that they've built to then translate that into how do you build a plastic supply chain around that. So many times it's just helping brands understand that a lot of what this is, it is really similar to some of the things they've done in the past and finding kind of those complementary pieces such that it makes it easier for a big brand to adopt. And then ultimately the last step is in implementing that, you know, as implementation partners, it's not enough to know where the issue is. You have to also be able and really, and really willing to solve it, which has been something that HP has been so good at. Um, we're also partners with, with some of the, uh, the next wave brands as well. And, and that's something that you see across all brands that want to do this. Well, it's the idea that they know where the problem is, they know what needs to be solved, but then they're also committed enough to actually implement those solutions. And, and I think those are the three really important ingredients. And, and I would just add, you cannot be afraid of the problem, right? The problem is real. We all you know, acknowledge this, uh, but as a company, you have to be willing to take a risk and be brave and step into things that are really difficult. Uh, and again, with the, the confidence and the expertise um, with strong partners, I think then you can, you can arm yourself um, together to be able to go tackle some of these things that are uh, really difficult and daunting. I'm always so impressed by with what HP has done in this particular space is you tested out the concept of integrating ocean-bound plastic into one product, but then through the marvelous way that you were able to really infiltrate departments across HP, and get them excited and see the possibilities and so they can start to get engaged with it. You now are producing products with ocean bound plastic at a, at a scale that we don't see anywhere else. And it really is a testament to how you have been able to engage internally with stakeholders and really get them excited about the possibilities and excited to kind of lean into this problem. And so I, Dave, to your question to Helen of, uh, to Helen of like, what does it take to get this done? I think it takes somebody internally within a company who is willing to raise their hand and say, I have an idea, like, I don't know exactly how this is gonna work out, but I have an idea and I need partners that can join this journey with me and scale this thing up. And that's why we see product after product after product <laughs> coming out of HP. I can't even keep up with how many products are coming out of HP right now that integrate this material that allow these supply chains to scale up. So I just wanna give some kudos to Ellen and I think that you need to give a masterclass on internal change. <laughs> Thank you, we can maybe, uh, Let's do that, Ellen. I like that idea. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, here, and I want to sort of just like, you know, dovetail ac across continents to, to East Africa where, where you guys have your footprint. And, you know, when I, when I think when we're talking about getting involved with the really hard things and bringing that kind of front and center and facing it head on, we're talking about social issues, you know, a lot of times. And that can be really tricky when you're dealing with corporate procurement teams. So you guys have recently just had a huge success with Unilever. Uh, I, if you could just you know, tell us about how you made that happen and how you were able to bring that to life and work with, how you work with procurement to get these things done. Um, there's two, two, two elements. So one is the element of collaboration, right? Um, two, two, two organizations, three multiple organizations trying to sort of head to the same thing. Um, and then there is the, the element of inclusion, right? especially when we when we talk about uh, sourcing ocean bound plastic or just plastic uh, recycled plastic in, into sort of these very formal and, and demanding supply chains. Yeah. And I think um, if we touch on the element of procurement and what we were able to do in, in Unilever and what what are the sort of the, the secret sauces of success that allowed us to in a in a uh, a, a time frame of like maybe one, one and a half years to go from um, commitment to all the way to launching the first product um, that is local, so localized in a local uh, circular economy. Uh, if I had to choose and if I, if I reflect on that, I think I would definitely say commitment from the top. Um, so this is, a, this is a demanding element 
that goes down all the way to the sort of the middle management levels of like, guys, we want this done. We want the product in the market by that time. So it becomes a KPI, um, makes it very, very tangible for everyone involved internally in, 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 in within the corporate or within the brand structure uh, to make decisions and work towards that. Uh, so because if it's just on the side, um, it doesn't allow uh, people to move. We all have daily jobs. And if it's not part of the daily job, it's very hard to move forward and build traction. We've experienced that even um, discussing with other brand owners um, uh, that the commercial part and sort of the vision, the strategic, part, strategic parts um, are sometimes out of sync. And, and the reason why they're on the, out of sync is in the commercial, like a very typical procurement team is, is focused on KPI saving costs and has targets to meet. And then in the strategic element, you have a vision 2025 where we want to have, include PCR um, in, 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 in our products. And then um, that, that, is not very, that, that is not very empowering to the people who make the decision to actually buy PCR. And I think um, bringing those two worlds closer together and, and make it empowering um, could be a really big um, accelerator to, to bring PCR in the supply chain. And what helped me is uh, I had the privilege to have um, Paul Paulman, when he was still CEO of Unilever, coming to our factory, and that really speeded things up. Um, and uh, and, uh, I, I re and that, that's where I really want to say heads up to, to, to these top level managers who really saw that the opportunity there and really uh, give, give their teams, um, the, local, the local CEO teams, um, the, 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 the sort of the wind to say, hey, well done, you're doing something really great to choose a partner like that and now bring it to the next level. And that really, I think, um, is, is, a, is a factor of success. CEO trips to Nairobi. And Haiti, I, I like this idea quite a bit. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Kieran. Uh, Susan, so Circulate Capital is all about incubating private sector solutions and investing in technologies that can help the sector. And I know that Circulate Initiative is really like building a bridge to the nonprofit side of, of Circulate Capital is sort of really building a bridge to some of the more human elements. But I, I'd love, love to get your take on how you guys are working with the informal sector. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Circulate Initiative. So basically what we think about is how do we create and have support the supply chain and the entrepreneurs in it? So, you know, I totally agree with what the other panelists have said in terms of really needing that push from the top and that demand and pull. I think what we're seeing at the entrepreneur level and throughout the supply chain is that there's a lot of desire to meet that demand, but not a lot of understanding on how. And so I think there's a really important gap there of how do we um, make, you know, bridge the gap between a small recycler, let's say in Indonesia or a small aggregator, let alone like an, an, a waste picker and the procurement lines and the procurement offices of HP or Coca-Cola or Danone or somebody else. And I think there's a lot of training that could be done there on both sides to help bridge that gap. Um, when you think about some of the issues that come up, you know, there are things like how can you, um, have assurances there's no child labor in that supply chain? How do you know where the plastic is really coming from and then it's not contaminated? I think all of those people, the suppliers on the ground are eager to learn, they just haven't had to deal with that before. And so in addition to providing the demand, I think companies really are in a position to provide some technical assistance and mentorship to these smaller entrepreneurs so that they can help them navigate, you know, how do you set up a wastewater treatment plant that's gonna meet our specifications? How do you actually, um, what are the social issues that you have to look at? in order to meet our, um, our criteria to be a supplier. And you know, these aren't unfamiliar concepts. As Ian said, you know, we are used to companies looking at things like um, you know, knowing where their fish or their wood comes from, or knowing who made their textiles or apparel. This isn't that different. This is the same idea of companies really understanding their supply chains and being able to control them and to set standards for them all the way through. And then I think the key is helping those good actors in that supply chain meet those standards. Thank you, Susan. So since we're pre-recording, we can take breaks. So let's, we can take a break for a minute if everybody wants. Um, I think that was cool, great. Man. We're on a roll. Let's get some momentum. Let's keep going. <laughs> we can take I, I really want to keep break. talking to everyone. Now. I want to learn yes. all these things all right, that well, you're talking about. <laughs> Um, I'm going to get into the volatility in the secondary markets now. Does that work for everybody? And we'll just yeah, go. Yeah. So with, with COVID-19, it has absolutely had a devastating effect in a lot of places around the world on waste picking communities, specifically India, where a lot of the folks that are picking us to 
get the recycled goods to market to feed their families. Um, but all over the world, there's been really monumental issues with respect to the lockdowns that have happened. And the commodity markets have crashed. Oil's gone to like all-time lows. Virgin plastics as low as it's ever been and recycled plastics as low as it's ever been. And, you know, I think it's interesting. I was in a conversation with Ian. Maybe we can start with you, you know, about if it gets worse than this, we could be in a situation where waste pickers might just stop picking up plastic and start picking up other materials. So I'd love to get everybody's thoughts on, uh, on this and what we can do in this really trying time. Sure. I think you outlined um, a couple of the really big issues well. I think there's a third issue that's important to mention and something that we're seeing big brands struggle with is it didn't happen just because of COVID, it happened before COVID, but with the change in policy we're seeing in China around um, the acquisition of U.S. wastes, we're seeing kind of those all, that condition met with what's happening in the COVID moment um, is, is radically changing global, global conditions. And, and I think it's really important to understand um, before we even go into the solutions that uh, when margin gets passed on, um, along with price fluctuation, um, you know, that margin gets passed on to every level in the supply chain, all the way down, right, until it hits the bottom of the supply chain. Um, and, and in the bottom of the supply chain, the margin can't go anywhere else. So it's compressed. And people who were making eight or nine or 10 cents a, a pound um, of material are now not able to make a living where their margin is sustainable. So all of those kind of really big market conditions have come together and it's really challenged collectors um, who have, are used to getting, I, I, you know, I'll just say it, used to getting screwed by the market. Um, but now with COVID, because many of them can't come out of their homes or the, the market prices themselves are not good enough, you're seeing decisions being made by families that wouldn't be made in better times. And I'll use a, a one example, and I think this is a one we see all the time, but I think it's, it's highlighted now. Um, when you're not able to make as much of a margin on collecting a certain amount of plastic, in order to make that same amount of money, you need to collect more plastic. And as a mom or a dad who does that for a, a business, you look around and say, okay, well, what are, the, what are the ways that I can collect more plastic? And you look to your kids and you say, okay, well, if I need to collect more volume in order to make the same amount of money, then kid number one, we're going to pull you out of school and we're going to have you collect 50 pounds of plastic a day because that's what allows us to pull more money in. So you can see immediately how these big macroeconomic conditions drive to very personal human decisions on the ground. Well, now fast forward or, or, or flip then over to a big corporation who's trying to figure out how to meet a 2025 or 2030 goal and now is confronted with an even larger human problem. Um, you can see how the incentive is to, well, wait a second, we should probably shy away from this. It's cheaper to get virgin material right now. It's easier to stay away from child labor, but that's exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing in order to make these conditions change. Because when a large organization can set up a long-term offload agreement, you know, five, 10 years, or kind of a voluntary extended producer responsibility, where they're going to their suppliers and saying, we're gonna do this thick and thin for the next 10 years, five years, it sets up the conditions where when families are out there in the field, in the landfill, have on their route, trying to figure out how to actually move more material, it gives them a certainty that is not dependent on the day-to-day -day fluctuations of the market. So, I mean, that's just one really kind of specific example of how this affects people, but I think it's one that maybe illustrates some of the human elements uh, behind kind of these big, huge macroeconomic conditions. Kieran, in, uh, in, in Kenya, can you, can you elaborate what kind of what's happening on the ground over there with respect to COVID? And yeah, sure. I mean, of course, uh, I think the, the limitation for any uh, informal settlement, in movement, et cetera, is definitely taking a toll on, on, on incomes on a daily basis. But I think um, from, from, from our perspective, what we've seen is that, uh, and, and one of the premises that Mr. Green Africa brings, because we're building a network of informal pickers, aggregators, um, even all the way to the consumer, uh, trying to include them um, into our system of getting the supply, um, the, the, the centerpiece of these, the, the, the informal pickers is actually trying to sort of redefine the job waste picking and formalize that job. So we, we, when, we, when we set out and as we sort of scaled uh, our network and as we empowered it with, with tech, we realized, do we really want to create more pickers that go and roam around the streets or in dump sites? And, and, and that's how we then started thinking, okay, how can we pre-aggregate? Um, and how can we engage pre-aggregators, agents um, who are anyways in the markets, et cetera. And, and 
ultimately what this led us to do is create a much more stable um, income environment for our um, uh, pickers yeah and so that transition uh, from the sort of the side roads into a more sort of formal network helped us to be also more resilient now during COVID times. Um, and, and, and also, uh, I think one of the key, key, key elements here is uh, sort of, as you talked about, David, like the South being able to come, become a major supplier to this huge, ever growing demand from the top 10 corporates, I think alone, um, by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we say it's, it's an $8 billion market by 2025. I mean, this is huge. And, and, and if we, I look at the African continent, we could supply 2 billion of that. Um, if we were to sort of aggregate, um, formalize these networks around it. Yeah? And we would create a ton of jobs, a ton of um, um, sort of sustainable incomes. How do we um, safeguard this vulnerable community is really from a perspective of working with, with, with organizations like um, First Mile, you know, and, and bridging that gap and being able to um, sort of do that sort of volatility um, threshold. We do that as Mr. Green, we're trying to sort of safeguard those pr price volatility. So we don't pass on if the prices drop significantly, we take the hit in our margins. So what we want to basically try to do and have these conversations with the brand is like, are you aware that, you know, if you try to now pressure us in the pricing, we'll also, it, 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 it threatens our business model, number one, but it, you also threat the income of, of these guys and we can only do it so much. So why don't we secure ourselves in this ever-growing market on both set, on both ends where we say, look, we're not gonna go beyond a certain price, but you also not gonna go below another a certain price. And I think that's how we can find each other and create the stability for the whole sector and the system. And, and of course, the groups that should be part of that, uh, like the waste pickers. And I think it's really a system thinking that we need to apply here in order to address this um, uh, challenge or conversation. And I think, I, I mean, I think the one piece that I would add to this too that we haven't talked about yet is the role of policy in all of this, because I think policy can play an important piece in terms of supporting some of these other sections. So, you know, at Circulate Initiative, we just launched a new program called Urban Ocean with Global Resilient Cities Network and Ocean Conservancy. And that was designed explicitly to work with city governments on policies that can help support the kinds of conditions that the informal sector needs, that the entrepreneurs need, and that the businesses need. And so I think government is a key piece of this puzzle. And when I say, I say policy deliberately because I think a lot of people talk about regulations and bans, and those certainly have their places, but you can also talk about incentives for policies. And in some ways, I think those can be a lot more effective. If you incentivize companies to buy recycled um, content or put recycled content in their products, if you incentivize informal sector to collect, um, if you recognize the informal sector for the public service they are actually providing and provide them with the types of uh, recognition, whether it's sort of education, healthcare, and other things, um, to make them more resilient in the face of crises like COVID, I think you are already building a much more stable system that can withstand some of the shocks that we've been seeing. So um, I, I just think that that systemic approach is not just corporations, not just civil society, not just the informal sector, um, but really about also government policy and how it can support all of those different pieces. Totally. I think there, um, you know, the answer to this is really the collaboration between private sector and, and, and uh, government. And we've seen um, uh, in, in Kenya, we've banned plastic bags a couple in 2017, and that was not a collaborative approach. So the government and private sector have learned from that. And now when it comes to, you know, regulating plastic waste and creating a sort of a plastic circular economy, is, is it goes a long way that those interactions are very, very close. Um, on, on collaboration and then conversating on like, how can we do this? And this has, has really accelerated the conversations here in Kenya with industries um, that put, put models on the map. And one of the best things that made me really happy is that the conversation on like, what does the inform, like what role will the informal market have in all this? Usually this informal market has always been sort of forgotten and disrupted eventually. And I think now we have this, the, the, the beautiful chance to really leapfrog into saying, okay, how can we actually formalize them and truly make them part of it? And that will stabilize the whole system and will detach itself actually from a, a market price volatility that we now face with virgin and oil um, because it becomes its own feedstock and the own commodity in its context.
you know, when we think about companies that are part of the next wave member group, that network, these are companies that are in this for the long haul. They're not buyers of material. These are companies that actively want to participate in the market to create resilient communities and to create stability in these supply chains so that when we do have market volatility, for whatever reason, it could be a pricing issue. It could be, I mean, Indonesia, how many issues have we seen in Indonesia that are naturally caused? We've seen earthquakes and tsunamis and you know, typhoons come through and so many things that can disrupt supply chains and make it more difficult for communities to come back through. But if there's one thing that I would love to convey to the audience is that don't just be a buyer of the material. Buyers are great, but decide also to really get involved in this issue for the long term. It's not about one product that has ocean down plastic incorporated in it. It's about where can you place this within your supply chain to actually start to replace different types of plastic with material that's available. And then where do you need to create new supply or help participate in the development of new supply chains for material that is so integral to your entire company and what you produce. We have companies that are really looking at everything from not very non-sexy products because they know the supply is there, they know they can buy it at the right price point for them and for the market, and they can integrate as much of this material as they can to create stability long-term in that particular supply chain. And then we have others that are looking at, gosh, we have this kind of material in this product, but what if we tested it out with you know, a different type of, of ocean bound plastic that is available now or that we could scale up a supply chain, how much could we put in and are we then working to help create these scalable supply chains together? So, you know, don't be just a buyer of the material and watch it happen. This is an amazing opportunity to get really engaged, to work with First Mile, to work with Mr. Green Africa, to work with Circulate Initiative and to really start to build something together that has long-term stability and can really scale up. But you can't do that if you're just buying material and that's the only thing you're doing and you're not really caring about the entire supply chain from beginning to end. I would love to get Ellen's perspective on this because um, you know, I'll just use two really real world examples that, uh, just to build on what Dune said, um, that you know, we, two of our clients are, are Next Wave members, um, CPI and HP. And, and CPI is a credit card, they make credit cards um, for lots of organizations. And, and I'll, you know, in a kind of real world example of how um, you don't just buy plastic, you get involved. Um, you know, CPI and both CPI and HP leverage our expertise to help them actually build the supply chain, right? Like how do we map and build a supply chain that connects all these dots from the first mile into our last mile. But then also both organizations then also use money from their philanthropic efforts to push into as donations to our nonprofit partners that help them solve the social issues. And, and those don't need to be bad for business. Those donations are philanthropic, but they're also pushing dollars into social areas that um, are useful to the overall ecosystem for all the brands that are involved. And, and, and it solves a really important social issue at the same time. So when Dune says it's about more than just buying plastic, I, I think the way that we experience that and the way that we hear that and the way we see it is that the brands that we're working with are both investing in the kind of procurement nuts and bolts. How do I buy and sell and move material? And what are the economics of that? But then how can I use my philanthropic or foundational efforts as a, a large organization, whether I'm Unilever, CPI, or HP, and, and then how can we direct those into areas that improve the lives of people who interact with us in, in some way, shape, or form? And I just want to shout those two out because uh, we just see that in a very real way. Not a single one of our Next Wave member companies, even though they were cutting down on travel and they were cutting down on other expenses, none of them slowed down during COVID-19 and their commitment to solving for the ocean-bound plastic crisis. And that is the commitment we need. We need more companies like that who are willing to continue to, to hold to their commitment that they're giving to these communities because ultimately that's what it's about. It's about creating space where everybody can thrive. Everybody deserves clean water. Everybody deserves a healthy ocean. We need it, we demand it. And these companies are in it for the long haul and it's really exciting. That's exactly right. Um, the solution has to be holistic. If we were just looking at it from a plastic point of view and, and you know, securing supply for our products, it, it would fail. We wouldn't be able to stay in Haiti. We wouldn't be able to extend and scale our supply chain. 
Um, there would be other issues that would come up from a supply chain code of conduct where our supply chain and our company would say, you know, we're, we cannot operate in these type of conditions and we'd have to pull out. So for us to be able to stay, it has to be long term. We have to be thinking holistically about, you know, the three pillars of the way that we think about uh, our sustainable impact, planet, people, and community, and how interconnected poverty is to the ocean plastic pollution problem. And how do we think systemically across all of these, and again, find the best partners who are in it for the long game with us, um, building trust. Uh, you know, there's, there's huge trust when we've entered into, you know, doing what we're doing down here, um, and our partners are in it just as, as significantly as we are for the long term. And, and I think when we think about the future that we as a society all know we, we have to transition to, we have to transition to a circular economy. We don't have a choice, right? Uh, if we wanna to continue to consume as human beings at the rate and scale that we've become accustomed to and offer that to other populations around the world, uh, which is the fair and right thing to do, we need to be able to consume in a circular fashion. And that means we have to change, we have to start now. We could choose to delay it because of COVID. We could choose to delay it because of you know, the price of oil, um, but we're gonna have to face this sooner and later. So let's just do it right now. And that's what we're doing. Thanks, Alan. So we're almost at that time, but I would love to get your thoughts. You know, Kieran mentioned the $8 billion market in 2025 that is burgeoning. And there's a lot that we need to do to scale uh, and to really like build this symbiosis between the boardroom and between the people on the ground so that this market becomes more vibrant, these supply chains are set up and they are thriving. So if you could just, if all of you could just close with 30 seconds of what you think it's gonna to take to get us there, you know, between now and in the next five years. Maybe start with Ian. I would say that um, the tendency for uh, large organizations, if you're listening to this and you're thinking about doing this and you're in a large organization is to think, oh my gosh, this sounds so complex. It sounds overwhelming. It sounds, how do we get this done? How do we communicate this? There's so many things here where I could get, I could lose my job, right? Like uh, there's so much risk associated with this. And, and I guess, you know, having been with our organizations and our partners in the trenches for the, the, the past 10 years or so, I, I'm here to tell you that there is a playbook. There is a, a, a map, a way to get through this step by step um, that is, uh, certainly there are some intricacies um, within geography, but by and large, there is a way to do this that is not, not only is it not a burden to your organization, it's great for business. That if you do this correctly, it not only engages your customers and your board and your investors, but it engages your employees in ways that make them feel more connected to your organization. So I guess I would say in terms of next steps, if you're out there and you're thinking, gosh, how do we take the first step? Like what I'm here to tell you is that we can kind of all together help you through it. That would be my two cents, maybe five cents. <laughs> Thanks. What we've learned is that um, the collaboration with, with pioneer companies like First Mile, like Mr. Green Africa, like uh, Next Wave, I think they, that, that kind of collaboration, that interaction there um, can really go a long way. Once you sort of cracked the code in terms of like this works, I think then it comes really quickly to sort of collaborating and go across um, borders and try to replicate that with the same partners and try to leverage those learnings. And I think that's how we can get in, at, to scale in, in five years from now, where we're leveraging systems. As we are now coming out of this COVID situation, and as it's kind of like a reset button for the world, when we think of systems, we don't want to um, fall back into the old systems. I think there's a great opportunity to create new systems. And so for us, in order to pull this off in the next five years, it's all about speed and acceleration and, and, and unlocking these internal barriers to, to, to give the confidence to, to make quick decisions and, and start doing. Maybe I'd love to build on that because I, I think that point is really important. You know, we have an opportunity to think differently. And so I think what we need are companies like HP um, and others that are willing to think creatively because the systems that we need to build are not the systems we have now. You know, we don't, we're not going to get a New York City trash truck through the streets of Jakarta, right? That's a silly idea. But we can build a system that works for Jakarta or for Nairobi or for Ho Chi Minh City. We just have to think about what the context is of that. So we need to be flexible and willing to experiment a little bit with that and learn from all of the work that's been done before. I think we also need 
to start thinking about this, not, not just as we're trying to solve ocean plastics, but we're trying to solve ocean plastics, we're trying to solve GHG emissions, we're trying to solve dignified employment, and we're trying to solve economic growth for a city. And if you bring all of the people together who care about all of those solutions, you're going to get a much more robust and lasting solution than if we try to go in and say, hey, we really care about ocean plastic, you know, Mr. Mayor or Ms. Mayor, you know, will you work with us on that? Because mayors have a lot of other things they need to worry about. And unless we can think of solutions and build solutions that are actually going to solve multiple problems, they're not going to last beyond sort of our individual efforts. I'd love for Ellen to have the last word. <laughs> um, so I, I would say for everybody listening to this, there's a couple things that I would ask you to do. One is decide to really engage in this issue. And, and when you decide to engage in this issue, lean into it, right? Do everything you can to get your company on board and push your company hard. If you're still using a bunch of non-recyclable, single-use plastics within your own operations and they're non-essential, get rid of them. Right? If you're a company that is producing a lot of non-recyclable, single-use plastics that people on this panel are working with people who are trying to collect that on the end, think differently, right? This is, we still have, probably 12 million metric tons of new plastic entering the ocean every single year. That is not going away. So to hit 2025, you gotta commit, you gotta double down, you gotta triple down. You need to call Ellen, you need to ask her what she did. How do we scale this up internally? And really be part of the solution and do it quickly because we can't afford to have any more ocean go plastic going into the ocean. Um, but that's exactly what's happening this year what happened last year. It's probably what's going to happen in 2021. So be excited about the progress you're making, learn from it, and then use that to catapult yourself into a commitment that feels so audacious you probably are going to fail at it. And just know that every single person on this panel is here to support you. And, and we want to help you. We don't have all the answers, but I think that together we can really help to solve this one crisis which is truly solvable. Because I do think we need new systems and new ways of thinking. I also think this is one of the most solvable things that we have in front of us right now. And, and we can do this, right? So just lean in, double down, and raise your hand and say you know, where you need some support and we'll be there to support you. From my point of view, I, I want to echo a lot of the, the things that everyone just mentioned. But um, for a company like HP, I think it comes down to what is our vision? How are we contributing to the world? What is our purpose? and then full commitment to that vision. And HP's purpose is to create technology that makes life better for everyone everywhere. And this program, what we're doing with Ocean Bound Plastic is essential to be able to make that vision uh, be real. The world is changing. We know what the right thing to do is. We're committed to that. The market is changing. Our customers are changing. Um, you know, This year, we saw $1.6 billion in new sales due to the actions that we're taking around sustainable impact. When we look at our measures from our enterprise request for proposals, we can measure that. That's up 69% year over year. Our customers, the world is telling us, telling companies like HP, you need to do this more than ever. And with great partners like you have here on the panel, we're gonna do it and we can. So it's really exciting. I couldn't be more thrilled to be um, here today with these leaders who are creating this type of change. Well, well, thank you guys all so much for joining us for this panel. For everybody watching, thank you so much for, for, for tuning in. Look, are we going to do a picture go. real quick? Yeah. Yeah, 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 let's do a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Awesome. Really good group. Yeah. Thanks for bringing us together. Really, thank you guys all again for your time. Super grateful. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We are going to have a follow-up. Uh, question and answer session. And I want to echo what everyone was saying. We are here for you. If you have questions and you are trying to figure out how to navigate that, you can reach out, reach out to us at the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network. You can reach out to Next Wave. You can reach out to Circulate. The only way that we're going to do this and reach these goals and build these supply chains is together.